Authorities are still investigating the fire that happened aboard the Genius Star 11. And I brought an expert onto the channel to discuss the situation. Today I have Sal Mer Mercliano. Hopefully I got that right. Um, if, if you could, uh, why don't you introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. First of all, Patrick, thanks for having me on. Uh, big fan of the channel. Really love what you do. Uh, I am a, a, a maritime historian over at Campbell University. I'm a former merchant mariner, so I sailed ships for seven years, came ashore, became an academic. Uh, but I do a lot in uh, maritime industry and maritime policy. I hosted a channel, What's Going On with Shipping. And when I started at grad school, I became a volunteer firefighter. I've been a firefighter uh, on land since uh, 1999, been a captain at my local firehouse uh, for about 18 years. Oh, perfect. So I actually first found you when I when I was doing research on the Fremantle Highway incident, um, learned a lot about the shipping industry. I'm kind of familiar with myself just because I live on the Great Lakes. I actually live by the uh, Sioux Lock, so a lot of freighters going through there. Um, so I've kind of been around it, but not uh, not quite like you have. So uh, kind of getting into the story of the Genius Star 11, what we know right now is there were lithium-ion batteries on board, quite a large quantity. This is a ship that has what I see as four cargo holds. They call it two cargo holds, but each one has a upper and lower section. Can you tell me a little bit about the layout of these ships? Yeah, so this is a kind of, you know, the way you tend to move cargo today is by containers. I think everyone's familiar with the big boxes, that, you know, the tractor trailers going down the road. And that kind of modular design was created so that you can move cargo quickly and efficiently. You can put it on the back of a truck, you can put it on a railway, you can move it to a ship and then load it go. Genius Star 11 is a little bit different. Uh, it, it follows almost an old fashioned, what we would call a brake bolt model. You don't see containers on the upper deck. Matter of fact, what you have is all the cargo is below deck. And what you would actually have are these two large co cargo holds with split decks. And what you would do is load cargo in there in boxes or pallets. And because you're doing lithium ion batteries, what they're doing is that those tend to be very heavy. And, and what happens is if you load them in containers, it tends to max out the weight of the containers before you uh, fill up the containers. So it would take a lot of containers to haul this amount of cargo. So if you want to pack, you know, densely pack this cargo, you put it into a ship like the Genius Star where you can literally from top to bottom just load them in there. And so these would be packaged probably, we haven't seen pictures yet from the interior of it yet. I'm going to assume that they're using kind of a, you know, a pallets or brake bulks or maybe even small container styles in there. And so those containers would be stacked in there from, from the floor of the deck all the way up to the overhead. And one of the things that this ship did was it was coming all the way from Taiwan to the West Coast. And it took a very far northern route, what's called the Great Circle Route. That's actually the shortest distance. Uh, if you look at a flat map, it doesn't look that way. But if you look at a globe, it is. So you would go come all the way up along the coast of Japan, Russia, through the Aleutians and come down. And what happens is that ship is going to get a lot of motion. It's going to get a lot of uh, motion. And so uh, how that cargo is stowed is going to be a really important element. Containers provide you a lot of stowage capacity. You can put a lot of stuff in them. But unfortunately, when containers and cargo arrive on ships, it's usually sealed in the boxes. You never look in the inside. So you're not exactly sure how well it's stowed. And I think that's a question we're going to have here with Genius Star 11. Did the cargo shift in movement and maybe cause damage to the lithium-ion batteries that initiated the fire? Yeah, it'll be really interesting to see when that investigation comes out. I assume since this is a U.S.-based investigation, we should get a lot of information. Um, but I know investigations, they, they take some time, and there's a lot of work that goes into them. And I've been following the location of this vessel. It, it's still up in Alaska. It's still in that harbor. Now, with this cargo, uh, it seems like they'll load the lower section first, and there's some type of bulkhead that goes over top. And then they load the upper section. Is that kind of accurate? Yeah, they, they, they would have what they call a tween deck, and it's kind of the between deck, and that's a, the, the nautical phrase for it. And the reason you did that is because you would want to segregate the cargo. You also don't want to stack the cargo on top of each other, so causing the weight to crush at the bottom end. So you want to do that. And, and again, one of the things you wanted to do, especially with, with Taiwan that produces a huge amount of lithium-ion batteries, is, is be able to ship them over in large quantity. The problem is they're, they're hazardous material at times, so you have to be careful about where you load them on the ships uh, and again, like I said, they're, they're really heavy. And, and so it creates a big problem. You would need, you know, in terms of volume of containers, much more than the weight of the containers. So, you know, if, if you know, if you can load the boxes and on a, a, a purpose-built ship like this for that, 
you would do that. So you'll notice there was no cargo up on deck. They put it all below deck so it can be out of the elements. It's not getting uh, you know, seawater. It's not getting cold. It's all protected by the environment and sealed below deck. The, the problem you do have with that is when you have a fire in a vessel like that, there's almost no access to the cargo. It's not like you're going to get down there in the cargo hold with, with hoses and, and SCBAs and be able to fire and fight that fire. That's one of the reasons why they use the CO2 system on board. But as you know, as anything else, that does, it's really not going to do anything on a lithium ion fire. Back in the day on ships, we used to have halon systems, which were great, but we got rid of halon because of environmental issues. But still, it doesn't matter because as they self-oxidize and create their own air, that oxygen, excuse me, you're not going to get them out. So the best you can do in this case is really try to mitigate it. What was really important, I think, is if the fire was contained in that lower deck, it didn't spread through the bulkheads to the forward uh, hold. Uh, it didn't get into the engine room back aft. And I'm not exactly clear it got into the upper deck where that where it could have spread even more because the, the big danger you had here was the entire cargo would conflagrate and you would lose the ship. Now, I assume there are some type of uh, man doors or some type of access to the cargo hold, but I, my guess is the the packaging, all the uh, the product is stacked in such a way there's probably not a, a lot of room to move around. Is that fairly accurate? Yeah. I, I mean, just imagine, you know, the, a big open room and you would want to fill that up as, as efficiently as you can. So you're going to take box after box and stack it as high as you can. Plus you want to put as much in there because it prevents the cargo from moving. So, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of like opening up the, 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 the back doors of a tractor trailer and there's nothing but boxes stacked up there. You know, it, it's almost impossible to gain access to it. Uh, and, and even if you start making access into it, uh, it's almost impossible to maneuver through the area. And, you know, where are you going to go? And plus the problem you have is heat. I, I mean, the heat, once you have the fire in the, in the compartment, they're not designed to expel the heat. And so you're going to get a massive amount of heat. The smoke's not coming out. So the big danger you have is when you open up the hatches into these holes, not only can you not access it, but now you're feeding oxygen into it. And, and you know, this is, a, this is something we saw happen on board a uh, car carrier, the Ho Chi Minh, down in Jacksonville, Florida, back in 2021, where they had a fire on board uh, a car carrier. Uh, they, they released the CO2 on the deck, and then Jacksonville Fire Department opened up a hatch, and what they had was, was a, basically a backdraft. They had an air explosion come in, and it blew the top off the air ventilators on the top of the ship and hurt nine Jacksonville firefighters and five of them to the hospital. Yeah, that's, that's a rough situation. And I just want to be clear, because... You know, a lot of people realize lithium ion batteries, they don't need oxygen to burn, but introducing that oxygen, you've got all that packaging around the lithium ion batteries. You've got other materials in there other than just the batteries. So the CO2 system, it's going to suppress the fire in the packaging. It's going to hopefully contain that fire to just the thermal runaway in the lithium ion batteries. And then you don't have that cascading effect from package to package to package. That's the idea there. And that seems to be what they did um, with the Genius Star 11. They they left that, they, they fired the CO2 system off and they left everything sealed up for a number of days until they were sure that that fire had stopped. Um, now, personally, I've, I've been to a lot of conferences. I've talked to uh, different people in the shipping industry, different shipping industries. And I know when you ship lithium ion batteries, a lot of design work goes into the packaging. Um, they've, got, they've got requirements where they have to drop the package they have to expose it to different uh, motions, G-forces, G to make sure that those batteries don't become damaged and they don't get a fire inside the package. The other thing they do is they should be shipping these batteries at least under 30% state of charge because uh, a fully charged lithium-ion battery, if it fails, it's very energetic. If it's down underneath that 30% 30% state of charge, it's not going to be quite the reaction that you would get um, at full state of charge. So. These are some things that are really important. Um, one of the things I noticed, um, I know I flubbed this in my last video talking about the thermal imaging, but all the pictures of the cargo holds kind of lead me to uh, lead me to think that cargo hold number one was right in the middle of the ship, right between the engine room, and then cargo no hold number two would be up towards the the bow of the ship. Do you think that's fairly accurate? Or do they kind of? Is there no real standard on how they number these cargo holds? 
Oh yeah, I, everyone numbers them differently, but yeah, I, I would say the fire took place in that midship hold. Uh, I mean, so what you have is, is is a ship. If you look at it, the engine room is back aft. There will be a double hull between the engine room and the cargo, so you'll have a coffer dam, a void space between the two. And then, so uh, this ship had its bridge and engine room only in the back end, the aft vessel, aft vessel part. And then you had two holds. The middle hole is where the fire probably took place. It looks like the lower hole based on where the heat was. And then the forward hold above it, uh, forward of it, excuse me. And so I think you're exactly right. I think one of the things we're going to look at for the NTESB, the National Transportation Safety Board uh, report that comes out on this, is how was the, these uh, uh, lithium ion batteries stored? I tend not to think that they were all in there, just boxes piled on top of each other. There was probably some segregation in there. They were probably in some sort of container or module of some kind that were in there because that would have prevented the entire content going on fire and, and spreading even more. The, the danger here was it was, it was going to just jump from hole to hole and go. And here you have to fight a very defensive fire. Uh, we were talking just before this. You know, I was, a, I was a firefighter on ships for a long time, and then I became a firefighter on land. And the big difference that I always noticed was on land, you have that tendency to want to ventilate, 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 and get in there and put the water on the fire. In shipboard, it's exactly opposite. You want to smother it, you want to cut it off from air, and you want to be very defensive and cool and try to keep it contained and assume that where the fire is is lost and just keep it that way. And that seems to be what they did. It was, it was good for them. They were close to Dutch Harbor. They were able to get in there. They were able to do some fire prevention. Remember, very small crews on these vessels. And these vessels, you know, while they're the, the mariners are trained as firefighters, that's very secondary to their mission. Plus, you have to keep navigation, you have to keep the engine room going, so you don't, even if you have a, you know, a, a dozen or two dozen people on board a ship, that doesn't mean you have that many available for firefighting. And so instead, what you really want to do is maintain where they are. So I think once the NTSB gets in, if we look at how that packaging is, you know, the fact that they did not lose the ship is a, is a key thing. I, th I think it actually shows something. What could have happened, and again, just my supposition, is that this is very rough water. It's, it's December in, in the North Pacific. The ship got thrown around a little bit. And that's probably a little bit out of the parameters for where you want to store lithium ion batteries. And so if they were in boxes or packages and they shifted and could have potentially taken a jar outside the normal limits, you could have cracked a cell, created that initial thermal runaway and have the fire. But fortunately, they were very good in keeping, not just using the CO2 system, but keeping it sealed so you kept the environment below the burn, you know, the oxygen limit needed to sustain fire. Right. And you look at that image from the thermal imager and you, you can see the heat from the engine room and you, that cargo hold is definitely warmer. And then the front cargo hold in the bow there is is ice cold. So it, it's really telling to me. And when you compare that to an image like from the Fremantle Highway, where that, that ship was hot, there was a lot of heat in there and you could see it. The sides were warped. Um, a lot of damage to the exterior of that uh, vessel compared to this one where there was no damage to the exterior. I suspect that it's probably limited to just a handful of package uh, packages inside that uh, inside that cargo hold. And um, yeah, I'm really looking forward to seeing the investigation and, and kind of doing an update when we really know all the details. Yeah, that, it's a really key point, Patrick. I mean, when you come on to do a shipboard fire and you notice the outside, you know, we are always told to look for smoke and look for discoloration. If you start seeing discoloration on the side of a ship, that's intense heat. I mean, I mean, it's it's heat beyond what you're normal seeing, and and it happens very quickly and very very rapidly. And again, this ship, you know, again that cargo hold too is low. It, it's surrounded by water. It's a little bit below water there, so the you get natural cooling on the sides there to begin with. I, I think the crew did an exceptional job in, in keeping this contained and, and, and it's not easy. You have to seal all the uh, ventilation going in. You have to drop the dampers. Uh, you have to cut off air circulation going in because usually you do have air circulating in these holds to maintain temperature and humidity. So you usually have climate control of some kind going on. They were able to get rid of that. Uh, and they have limited CO2 use. I know you had that great picture of all the CO2 bottles on the sh side of the ship there that they have to get exchanged and pulled out. But they usually don't have enough CO2 to flood every hold. So you have to get a jump on it very early. So, you know, once it gets out of certain holds, you're not going to be able to use multiple CO2. Uh, basically, you have one shot at it. And it looks like they did a good job at keeping it contained. You know, they, they took their time. They're methodic, methodical about uh, getting to the point where they did ventilate that structure. Because, again, this is confined space. You know, it's not really a, a great environment to go into. So they got... They got ventilation in there after the fact. They're doing their investigation. 
And I want to remind everybody, this is still a dangerous situation because you've got potentially thermally damaged lithium ion batteries still in this cargo hold. And until they can offload product to get to where the fire damage is, there's always a risk that those those cells are going to go into thermal runaway again um, just because they are damaged. You know, that, that vessel is not secure out there. It's it's on a mooring ball, so it's still going to be rocking back and forth. And depending on the weather, you know, you just don't know what's going to happen. Yeah, if, if you go back to Fremantle Highway, when they brought that ship into the Netherlands, one of the processes they did is they offloaded all the vehicles below the main fire deck, dumped them into water tanks to basically inert the the, the the batteries because they they just knew that because they were subjected to such heat and damage and potential water damage that they needed to ensure that they were safe. They just couldn't take the chance of putting them on a flatbed and and all of a sudden they burst into flames. So it is going to be a salvage process. It's going to take a while. There was a fire a year or two ago on board a container ship, the Zim Kingston, that went into Vancouver, Canada. Uh, It was an outside fire, but they believe it was a lithium ion that uh, battery that initiated the fire. But it took a while for that ship to sit out at the anchorage till they could assess it and then do a offload to make sure that all the material was properly taken care of, the containers were opened. Uh, you're going to have to bring this ship in somewhere and offload it piece by piece with firefighting standing by, salvage crews. Right now what you'll see is a salvage company is going to, is hired to take care of this. They will oversee, bring the ship into a port somewhere and begin the very methodical offload to ensure they'll probably offload the cargo from the forward hold first, get that out, see what they can salvage and contain and then work their way down to the fire deck. Yeah, this definitely won't be an easy process. But I want to thank you for coming on my uh, channel, uh, giving us some insight into the shipping industry, um, insight into this incident as well. Uh, do you have any any other comments on this incident? No, I, I think, you know, as, as firefighters who are close to water and deal with ships, uh, understanding the shipboard firefighting is really essential. I, I think we, you know, we all learned a very powerful lesson when Newark Fire had to respond to a fire on board Grand Costa de Borio and two firefighters were lost. Uh, the training just wasn't there for those firefighters. It's come out very clearly uh, that Newark was not spending the money on that. So, you know, as a firefighter, whether it's 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 a massive car carrier, a container ship, a small vessel carrying lithium ion batteries, or even a small pleasure boat of some kind, you know, it's a different environment. And so just make sure you've got the training and capability to go fight that fire or else be very defensive until you can bring in experts and get some uh, get some right opinions about how to go about tackling this. Because the the, the sea is unforgiving. And 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 if you give it a second, uh, it, it will it will show you it's dominant over everybody else. Yeah, absolutely. And that's one of those things that uh, as firefighters we're we're very aware of these high risk, low frequency events. And you know, this is the type of thing that that happens very rarely, but we have to be prepared for it. Um, because if not, the alternative is is not great at all. So again, hey, thanks a lot for coming on the channel. Really appreciate your insight. And uh, hopefully, well, hopefully we won't have to, but I'm sure there's going to be more uh, fires in the future the, on, on the seas that we'll have to discuss. Hopefully you learned a lot about the shipping industry and the difficulties aboard a ship when there is a fire. If you want to learn more about lithium-ion batteries and why the state of charge matters, click this link right here.